We're not under the law. You need to stop trying to earn your salvation. You can't keep the law anyway. No one could. That's why Jesus came and did away with it. We're free from that legalism, and the only two laws we have anymore are to love God and to love your neighbor. If you've been on this path for any length of time, you've heard all of these and more. Maybe you've even said some of these things in the past. Guilty. If you enjoy seeing how the apostolic scriptures affirm the ongoing validity of the Hebrew scriptures, then you don't want to miss this fascinating connection between them in this week's 5-Minute Torah. Welcome, my Shalomis. It's great to be back with you for another 5-Minute Torah episode. I hope you're enjoying these weekly connections to the Torah portions. Before we dive into my commentary, I'm going to give a brief overview of this week's Torah reading. This week, we're studying the Torah portion of Kitisa, Exodus 30, 11 through 34, 35, and here are the three things that you need to know about it. Number one, Egel Zahav, the golden calf. The bulk of this week's Torah portion is focused on the Egel Zahav, or the golden calf. While Moses is at the top of Mount Sinai receiving the covenant on behalf of the children of Israel at their spiritual zenith, the Israelites plunge to one of their lowest lows. They created a golden idol to take the place of the unseen God who had just delivered them from generations of slavery. They even went so far as to say that the golden idol was actually the God of Israel himself. After they made it, they proclaimed, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This is chapter 32, verse 4. When Moses saw what the children of Israel had done, he threw the tablets down and shattered them. After that, he commanded the Levites to take their swords and slaughter those leading the Israelites into idolatry. Approximately 3,000 men died that day because of idolatry. The God of Israel doesn't share his affections with other gods. Number two, Yom HaShabbat, the Sabbath day. Up to this point, the children of Israel had been told to keep the Sabbath, but there have been no explicit warnings about the gravity of its sanctity. In our current Torah portion, however, the critical nature of the Sabbath is made crystal clear. God tells the Israelites, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Everyone who does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. This is Exodus 31, 13 through 15. Since the covenant at Sinai, the Sabbath has been the wedding ring that Israel has worn as a sign of her fidelity to the God who redeemed her. A common saying is that it's not so much that Israel has kept the Sabbath, but that the Sabbath has kept Israel. A very true saying indeed. And number three, Shalosh Esrei Midot, the 13 attributes of mercy. This week's Torah portion also contains God's revelation of his 13 attributes of mercy. After destroying the first set of tablets, God tells Moses to cut new stone tablets so that he can write on them once more. Moses climbs Mount Sinai to receive the Torah anew. In the process of receiving what most people call the law, God reveals to Moses these 13 merciful attributes of his character that underscore his divine compassion and forgiveness he longs to bestow upon his people. If you want more great teachings like this, plus a community of people who are striving to love God and love others, then Shalom Macon is where you should connect. We live stream our services every Saturday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Eastern. Our 9 a.m. service is liturgy and Torah service, and our 11 a.m. is a contemporary service with music and teaching. You can also connect with us on our website at Shalom Macon.org. From there, you can learn all about Shalom Macon and find ways to connect with others from all around the world. We look forward to joining you this Shabbat at Shalom Macon. It's the place to learn, connect, and grow. I'll see you there. This week's Torah commentary is called Freedom on the Tablets, and it comes from my book, 5-Minute Torah, Volume 2. Parashat Kitisa is the transition between Moses' encounter with the Lord on top of Mount Sinai and his return to the children of Israel at the base of the mountain. While in the sublime presence of God, he was given a very special gift, quote, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. This is Exodus 31, 18. 
The Midrash tells us that these tablets were brilliant to look at because they were made with lapis lazuli, a deep blue semi-precious stone with intense color. The Torah uses the following description for the tablets. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets, Exodus 32, 15 through 16. These commandments were not just something Moses came up with. These words, as well as the very tablets themselves, were given by God himself. Our sages use this passage to relay an important message about the divine origin of the commandments God gave to Moses to transmit to the children of Israel. It says, and the tablets are the work of God, and the writing is God's writing, engraved on the tablets, quoting Exodus 32, 16. Read not engraved, charut, but liberty, charut, for there is no free individual except for he who occupies himself with the study of Torah. And whoever occupies himself with the study of Torah is elevated, as it is stated in Numbers 21, 19, and from Matanah, meaning the gift, to Nahaliel, and from Nahaliel to Bamot, meaning the heights, from Perkevot 6, 2. Here the sages use a play on words where the Hebrew word harut, engraved, is read slightly different from the simple reading. Using the same letters that are written in the Torah, which has no vowels, a single vowel sound is changed to infuse this passage with a new meaning. Not only can we read it as charut, which means engraved, like I said, but we can also read it as charut, liberty or freedom. When most people think about God's law, the furthest thing from their mind is liberty or freedom. Because of a persistent misunderstanding of Paul, most people view God's law as oppression. But God has given these commandments to a people he had just liberated from the oppression of Pharaoh. Why would he deliver them from one form of tyranny only to replace it with another? This is why our sages give us an alternate reading of this passage. James, the brother of our master Yeshua, understood the Torah in this context and viewed it with this high regard as well. In two places, he speaks of it with affection, alluding to this same rabbinic understanding that God's law is freedom on the tablets. He tells us, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, or you could translate it freedom, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. This is James 1, 22 through 25. So speak and act as those who are being judged under the law of liberty, or freedom. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is James 2, 12 through 13. James clearly tells us here that there's a big difference between a hearer and a doer. Maybe God's law is not as burdensome as we have imagined. Maybe it is a burden only when we walk away from its instruction and fall into our own devices. Maybe, as James tells us, it's a place of bondage only when we hear its instruction but refuse to obey. Following God's instructions, however, frees us from running headlong down the path of destruction created by our own wisdom and our own boundaries. Yeshua, being the incarnate Word of God, embodies the wisdom of the Torah and the commandments. Therefore, when we follow Yeshua while simultaneously holding on to the commandments of God, we walk in freedom. Take a look at Revelation 12, 17 and chapter 14, verse 12. God's Torah is not a burden, but freedom. John reminds us of this. He said, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5, 3. What is written on the tablets? A bunch of restrictive laws that seek to dominate our lives? No, freedom is written on the tablets, but only if we can look diligently enough to see it.
Did you grow up being taught that Yeshua came to set us free from the laws of the, quote, Old Testament, that he died to release us from their bondage? What's your story and how did you arrive at your current understanding of God's law, the Torah, and its ongoing application to our lives? I would love to hear your story. Just leave me a message in the comments below. If you're wondering where to go from here, then just click on the playlist right here to rewind your faith in our Got Milk series. We step back and examine some of the assumed elements of our faith from a perspective that might just revolutionize the way you read your Bible. Blessings from Shalom Make in the place where disciples of Yeshua learn, connect, and grow. Please visit our website, shalommakin.org, to learn more about us, join our live services, access other teachings, sign up for our newsletter, join our private network that will connect you with our greater community from around the world, or contribute to the work of Shalom Macon. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to connecting with you.